Uh, so hello everyone, welcome to uh, the W3C meeting on the 21st of June 2023. Um, it's good to see um, some people here um, uh, uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the session. Um, so in terms of an agenda for today, um, there were two things that I wanted to do. So first of all, um, I want to talk a bit about a paper we're developing for the steering committee about approaches to maintaining the open active technical infrastructure. Um, and then uh, I, there's just an opportunity for any, uh, any other business at the end. And one thing I want to do there is just provide a quick update on why I haven't come back with a work plan and roadmap yet, which is something that I said I'd do a few meetings ago. Um, so does anyone else have any A or B they would like to add to the list? Okay. Great. So what I'll do is I will uh, crack on um, and I will start talking about uh, this, this maintaining technical infrastructure piece. Um, so um, the first thing to note is that the slides I'm about to share with you are draft um, and I'm presenting them here for discussion to help me finalise them so that they're slightly less draft when we take them to the steering committee next week so they can have a discussion around maintaining the infrastructure. So I'm putting a big health warning at the top of this that these slides aren't finished. They're a little bit messy in places, um, but what I want to do is use your brains to test them um, uh, and, and that will help me improve them ready for next week's steering committee. Um, the issue that we're trying to address with these slides is the, the steering committee have asked us for thoughts on how we improve the long-term maintenance of open active and how we make sure that the infrastructure is secure for the future so in this deck what i'm doing is i'm going to start talking about some of the things that we should be thinking about in maintaining the infrastructure um, and some of the things that are common in open source initiatives um, and then uh, do a quick options appraisal uh, and hopefully that will stimulate discussion at the steering committee um, I also up front want to credit Nick because these slides build on some prior work that he did. Uh, hi, Nick. It's good to see you joining. Um, so, so some of us will feel familiar, Nick. Um, uh, but yeah, what I'll do is I'll present the slides as I'm planning to present them at the steering committee and then we can have a chat about them afterwards. So I'm going to start my session at the steering committee by being really clear about what the presentation is not about. So it's not about the governance of open active and the infrastructure um, and the reason it's not about that is because um, th there is a bigger discussion going on about how open active will work and what its executive will look like uh, and to some extent the infrastructure is governed by th that, 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 that organizational governance but also by the specifications themselves. I think the other thing that this presentation isn't about is the specifications uh, and the code base and whether those are open or closed. The assumption here is that those things will always be open. Um, this is purely about trying to find a solution to the maintenance of the infrastructure. So what I've done based on Nick's prior work and based on some reading about open source uh, and thinking about open active itself so i've tried to come up with some uh, aims for our infrastructure maintenance so we want to move to an operating model for the infrastructure that is financially stable um, that enables the infrastructure to continually improve um, that's efficient and effective uh, and enables incidents and problems to be resolved quickly uh, that reduces the risk of open active being dependent on any one participant um, enables users of the infrastructure to contribute to its maintenance um, and enables the executive, whatever shape or form that takes, to manage infrastructure related risks. So I've been, so in terms of developing this, I've been looking at research into sort of the sort of state of open source maintenance more generally. Um, and there's an American company called Tidelist who've been undertaking research into open source maintenance for a number of years. Um, and they've identified a, a whole set of trends that are quite interesting, I think quite relevant to this discussion about how we maintain open active. Um, so, so first of all, um, their research shows that 60% of maintainers describe them as unpaid hobbyists. Um, 
The remainder consider themselves to be professional or semi-professional maintainers. Um, and and these, these more professional maintainers are generally paid by empl their employers to maintain private product. Um, they looked at how many maintainers overall get paid to maintain, and how many don't, and they found that about 46% do not get paid to maintain their projects. And that's been fairly consistent over the time they've been doing the survey. Um, this was a survey of maintainers, right? So they asked maintainers what they thought. And of course, 77% of them said they would appreciate getting paid. Thank you very much. They, they, they want to be paid. Um, and they also said that the more they get paid, the more they would do maintenance work on open source projects. Um, but it isn't just about pay. So when they were asked more specifically about how they would like to be supported, most maintainers said they would like more income, but actually there were two categories about getting more find, finding experienced help. Uh, and those two, two areas on experienced help got a higher score. So actually, whilst that table on the, the right of the slide looks like maintainers want more money as their primary driver, if you add the percentages on two and three together, you get a higher percentage. So actually what maintainers want is more support and then more pay. Um, it's really interesting research. Um, and it, it does show this kind of a fairly mixed ecosystem of paid and unpaid people. Um, one of the things that came through really strongly, though, was that the, the pressure on maintainers is increasing. The pressure to maintain secure, reliable software that responds to regulation uh, that, that is modern is, is actually putting lots of pressure onto maintainers. Uh, and there is actually a real burnout issue amongst maintainers and quite a lot of open source projects are starting to see their maintainers disappear because it's just too much pressure to be on one or two individuals. Sorry, Andrew, can you just, can you just explain to me what do you mean by maintainer? OK, so um, that's a great point. Um, I'm going to make a quick note of that because that will come up next week. So a maintainer is a person who is responsible for the management of a, a, an open source code base. Um, and most open source projects will have one or more maintainers. Um, and those maintainers will be supported by contributors who make changes. So, so the maintainers are the people who kind of approve change in, in the code base. I will work on a better definition. I know that's probably not quite your definition, Nick, but I'll improve that. Um, I think more generally, Research into kind of volunteering shows that volunteers can are more likely to continue volunteering if they can see that their contribution is being valued by the organisation they're volunteering for. So I'm involved in a couple of voluntary organisations outside work, and both of those have done research into kind of um, engagement of their volunteers. And one of the things that comes through time and time again is that, that it's about volunteers understanding that their contribution is making a difference and is valued by the organisation they're volunteering for. So what, what does that mean for open active? Um, well, considering the practice in the wider open source sector, it's probably acceptable and, and actually necessary due to the kind of limited funding that open active has that for open actives maintenance to involve voluntary contributions, particularly from those who are benefiting from the infrastructure. Um, we need to be able to pay for maintenance but we, we need to be able to pay for maintenance when it's not reasonable to ask volunteers to do a task. Um, and we need to be really clear that we're making reasonable demands on volunteer time. We need to manage those volunteer contributions really closely. Um, and above all, we need to be really clear about who is accountable and responsible for what. So responsibility versus accountability. Um, the, the kind of generally accepted definitions that hit, uh, of these things are that, that responsible participants are those who are responsible for successfully completing project tasks. Uh, and they would, in the open active context, the responsible participants would be the people who are undertaking the maintenance of the infrastructure, undertaking development and operational tasks. The generally accepted definition of accountable is that they're the participants with the authority over successful completion of tasks. Um, and in the open active context, the accountable participant would be accountable for ensuring the infrastructure is maintained. And what I tried to do is bring some of that thinking about different open source models, bring some of Nick's prior thinking about different ways of maintaining open active. Uh, and I 
tried to kind of come up with some some high level options for maintaining open active so there are many maintenance models we could adopt for open active um uh, and Nick did a good job of analysing quite a few of those um, in, in his work. But what I've tried to do is take a step back and summarise them into four broad groups that we could adapt. And there are variations within each of these groups. Um, a couple of things to note. Under the current operating model of Open Active, I think on this slide, Open Active probably means the steward, which is the Open Data Institute. But if and when Open Active becomes independent, it's assumed that the, the, the new co would become the steward and, and Open Active would be Open Active. Um, so what are the four models? So the first model is that Open Active is responsible and accountable for the maintenance of the infrastructure. It provides in-house technical resources to maintain it. So that is the steward um, doing everything. Um, the second model is that Open Active retains accountability but outsources responsibility for maintenance to a managed services provider. Um, so in that model, Open Active is, 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 is making sure that, that the necessary work happens, but it's out, outsourced responsibility to a, a separate company or a, a separate organisation. Um, the third model is that Open Active retains accountability for maintenance, but grants responsibility to the Open Active community. And the fourth model is that Open Active grants responsibility and accountability for the maintenance to the community. So actually the, the Open Active entity, whatever that is, says actually we're not that interested in the infrastructure, someone else can manage it for us. So what I've tried to do next is an options appraisal. So what I'm doing on this slide is I'm appraising each of those four options, which are listed on the left hand side, against the five aims that we set out on the, uh, right at the start of the presentation. So, but because we're working in quite an uncertain environment at the moment, and we've got quite big outstanding questions about Open Active's future governance model and the business plan and funding availability and about the capacity in the community to support Open Active, it's only reasonable to undertake a high level appraisal. So for each of the options, I've given it a score of between zero and two. So if it scores a two, it, it achieves the aim. If it scores a one, it could potentially achieve the aim. And if it scores zero, it probably can't achieve the aim. And, and I've scored the options accordingly. So on financial sustainability, actually all of these models could probably be financially st stable. So they all get a one. The same on enabling continuous improvements. If you design the model in the right way and the, the operations within the model of the, the right way, they could all probably enable continuous improvement. Uh, and the same with effective and efficient support. Um, now it starts to get a bit more interesting. In terms of reducing dependency on one organisation, the first two options don't really do that because there is still uh, significant dependency on either open active or third party providing the maintenance. So I scored those zero, but for Option three, where Open Active has accountability, but the main responsibility for the maintenance is shared in the community, or option four, where the maintenance responsibility is and accountability is shared in the community, they, 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 they probably could work, so they get a one. In terms of enabling users con to contribute, um, options one and two could probably do that if they were designed in the right way. Options three and four definitely do that, so they get a score of a two there. And in terms of enabling efficient risk management, um, from an open active perspective, I think the first three enable effective risk management because open active is retaining accountability. But the fourth option, um, you, it's, it's less certain that open active could maintain risk, um, manage risk effectively. So when we add up all of the scores, what we see is that the optimum option is that open active retains accountability for maintenance. But it grants responsibility to that maintenance to the to the wider community. So what would that look like in 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 terms of structure? So bringing everything together, what we end up with is is a model a bit like uh, the picture shown on the left of this slide. So we have 
open active as a as a, a, an initiative with some governance at the top level and that that governance is accountable for the maintenance of the infrastructure we then have a kind of layer of maintainers and there may be multiple maintainers and i think it would be it, we should have multiple maintainers and those maintainers should probably collaborate in some sort of maintainer group to be defined and that maintainer group would be responsible for the maintenance of the infrastructure um because we are probably looking at a model where there are, is a mix of voluntary and paid contributions, we would have to have some sort of mechanism for deciding where there is an exception or an exceptional piece of work that needs to be paid for, and that we would need a mechanism for bringing funding out of Open Active to a maintainer or to another third party to deliver that piece of work. Um, in terms of the, the, the advantages and disadvantages to the model, so in terms of advantages, I think the operating costs are quite low. Um, we've got uh, decentralized knowledge and multiple developers, which means that there's redundancy and there isn't that dependency on a single point of failure. We've got flexible capacity um, that the, it can scale as open active grows. Uh, work can be quality assured effectively um, and, and maintenance maintainers can step away if they don't feel they need to make that contribution anymore or they can be ch changed and challenged if they're not performing. There are some disadvantages, of course. It's it's unpredictable in terms of resource commitment. Um, there's an overhead of operating that maintainer group, um, and you know we it doesn't mean it means that there isn't a kind of financial certainty for any organisation participating because work would be funded on an exceptions basis. So, in summary. The proposal to the steering committee is that Open Active moves to a model where Open Active retains accountability for maintenance but grants responsibility to the community. Um, we clarify roles and responsibilities clearly so everyone understands the role and the commitment they are making to Open Active. Uh, we develop a way of assessing if work should be funded and if there is consensus that a piece of work should be funded, we need to develop a mechanism to contract such work. Um, and we make sure that we're valuing volunteers' contributions. So that's kind of where I've got to with the steering committee deck. Um, I guess questions for W3C and, and for this community group um, are, are around whether you think this deck will prompt a useful discussion at the steering committee, whether you think there's anything that's missing from the content presented, and what the output you would like to see from the steering committee is. Um, I think being mindful that the deck is here to stimulate steering committee discussion, I'm not particularly interested in whether this is the right proposal. I'm more interested in whether you think this set of slides will stimulate a discussion and if that discussion will be a useful discussion. So I'm going to stop talking there and just pause for a moment and then give you time to reflect and, and raise any questions or answer any of those points. Andrew, I have I have a question and it's probably from a very naive perspective because I don't get how open source works necessarily. I'm not a developer. Um, but when you go back to your penultimate slide and it says that um, obviously the maintenance uh, is um, the one before that, I think. That's okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. So the, the maintainer group, is, does the maintainer group get approved or sort of vetted or signed off? Are they, is it just a random collection of people or how does it get, how does the maintainer group get constructed and monitored? That's a really interesting question. Um, I'm not sure I have an answer. Um, I think we would have to set some terms of reference for that group, as we would any other group involved in the kind of governance of Open Active, uh, and that's where we would define things like that. Based on my kind of six months experience of Open Active, I think the pool of maintainers is fairly small, so I think we would probably be able to understand who those maintainers were quite quickly, and if there were, and I think we'd be able to invite people to be part of that maintainer community as well. So I think that 
the group would kind of almost naturally form, but I think it would need some governance and some terms of reference to set out what it was doing and how it was reporting and who it was reporting to. I think the key thing is that it would be formally reporting to the Open Active executive in whatever form that takes. Yeah, OK. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Nick. I knew you'd appear. <laughs> I was just waiting for my appointed time. Um, <laughs> so uh, I, uh, yeah, yeah, great, great. And um, it looks like a good evolution from, from um, what I did before. So um, yeah, well done. It's uh, definitely um, good decision making stuff. I, I basically, I, I had like a few, a few questions. Um, so in the in the sustainable financially from the grid slide what it defines a one in that maybe i missed why they're ones or not ones those ones so so the reason i made those ones was because actually all four we could find a way of funding all four options but at the moment i can't say whether they're all definitely fundable and I can't say whether any of them aren't fundable because I've done no kind of cost benefit research I've done no market research so I don't know whether having a managed service provider will be absolutely more expensive than trying to manage a load of maintainers in the community so I, I think that they're ones because we we probably could achieve the aim using any of those models um yeah okay it's, it's a very, and, and... very binary assessment <laughs> Yes, I know I appreciate that. So it's one basically because it could all be done. Yeah. yeah. Um. Fair enough. So so I, I so I guess maybe um. I guess my gut uh, feeling, I, I guess my gut feeling on that though is if we were bringing in a team to sit in the organisational entity that will be open active, or if we were paying a managed service provider to sit there all of the time observing the infrastructure, theoretically that would be more expensive than a kind of model which is a mix of of voluntary labor and paid labor um you know that, that's got to be a cheaper operating model so you know while i've scored them all one as you as you could achieve the aim actually logically the first two are probably more expensive but i just have no evidence and i don't want to try and hoodwink people <laughs> yeah no that makes sense I, th I think maybe what what um would be helpful and i'm not sure if this is just kind of a prompt in case it comes up at that meeting or whether it would be useful to have a, a kind of formed view on it is there's a kind of sense of the broader economics of the ecosystem that drives the contribution. So, you know, within any set of volunteers that are doing anything, some of them are doing it just because they love it and for the heck of it. And, you know, they've got a personal project they want to you know, contribute to or whatever it is. Um, we've definitely seen examples of that in, in um, adjacent projects to open active. Um, but in terms of some of the kind of meteor stuff that goes on, because a lot of this is there's operational things right there's there's questions that need answering there's someone trying to make the test suite paths uh for their for their booking system and they want to figure out why this is broken or whatever it is and and then and then fix it um and so there's a sense of um i guess i feel like almost to, to, to just a, what one equivalent example would be kind of like it's not equivalent but just to make the illustration Google Chrome has Chromium and has Chrome. And if you need to rely on it for your enterprise, you get Chrome, right? Because it's backed with all the stuff. But if you are happy to, you know, mess about with it, then you, you then there's Chromium. And and the same with Red Hat, so, you know, there's, there's this kind of duality exists. And I and I I wonder if that notion of that duality is something that should be explored or represented in this slide deck so that people have a sense of. It, this isn't just about there's some operational stuff that needs to get done at whatever speed because it doesn't really matter if they do it today tomorrow or next year depending on their motivation and if it's an exception maybe we can spin someone up with expertise because the, there's, a, there's a kind of a reality to you know if there's an exception based approach and we only fund people when there's an exception but those people are busy and they haven't got time to deal with it and it's not in their business priorities then it, it doesn't get done that 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 exceptions process is potentially not a um scalable way to run a critical bit of infrastructure like you wouldn't run chrome like that right google pay people to run chrome like 
for, for, for the reasons that, that that exists. You might run Chromium like that. You might run the open source components like that because it doesn't really matter if someone can't be asked or they've got something going on or you know maybe they've, they've, they've got a whole day that um, is going to take them on a sabbatical for six months and they'll come back and look at the issue later. And I've seen threads like that. You know, when someone said, I've, I've tried to get to it, but I haven't had time. I'm sorry, I've tried to get there, I haven't had time. And you, you fast forward three years down and they've said, actually, you know what, I'm not, not actually going to have time for this. Sorry, guys, someone else can pick this up and it just goes dead because no one else can be bothered. And, and that's kind of the reality of volunteering, isn't it, really? Some passionate person's picked it up, but maybe, maybe haven't got time. And that, that's fine if it's Chromium. And I think the problem we've got here is that we're talking about Chrome fundamentally needing to exist for the underpinning of, of the kind of real work that happens here. And so um, that would be a, a lens that I'd maybe suggest that's interesting. might be worth exploring. That's interesting, because I was kind of thinking of Open Active as being more like Chromium than Chrome. Um, but I, I guess there is a, there's a link here to understanding what the absolute minimum viable product that has to exist and has to be maintained is and Howard's been doing some work on that and has some thoughts on that um, but in my head if we can make that, that that minimum viable core for open active to work as small as possible that minimizes the amount of risk uh, Howard do you want to come in there um yes I it was some early thoughts I'm trying to find the uh, the slides there but basically it was around the core being the standards, uh, but there's also a, a minimum amount of infrastructure. And this is things that we have, uh, like the activity list. Um, you know, this is kind of core, not static, but um, slow changing reference data for the sector. And there's the standards, which, which are, very, again, slowly changing. We were kind of honing in on, on that on that uh, and trying to get everyone up to that level um and then around that we've got some of the supporting infrastructure so this is things the tools that make it possible to um to access and validate and and use that data so we have things like the data catalogs which tell you where to go we have to find the data we have things like the validator and the test suite that help you get your data out there in the first place. Um, and then around that, we've got documentation and uh, documentation and, and tutorials and guidance and things like that around how to use it. And then beyond that, um, there's a set of extensions and we, you know, we're at times exploring new ways, new additions, potential additions to, to the new things you can do with the data over time. Um, and there are probably, and then another set of tools. So it's about understanding where where everything sits in that kind of scale. I don't know if you want to comment or or, or refine that, uh, Andrew, off the top of my head. No, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. I, I we, don't know if there's a. Oh, sorry, go on. No, no, go on. Go on. Oh, well, that, that sounds like a great, I mean, that, that's certainly what you've just described is, is my sense of the, the kind of key pieces of open active, as it were, and maybe the reference implementation in there, because you need to develop the test suite against it. And then there may be a couple of other things in their libraries, for example, that are used in, in production by various organizations. Um, and so, yeah, so certainly there's something like that. Um, but, but I don't know if I would, well, this might just be a kind of gentle poke at some of the language, just in case it affects the way that we think about things and and and, and the, the gentle poke if i may is at the concept of an mvp so for me mvp is used in an iterative context a minimum viable product is used in a in a lean process where you start to define what it is the thing that's going to get your product market fit that's your minimum viable product and at which point you then build on that and develop on that it becomes more than that and so the definite the, the the sense of an MVP is useful in the context of iteration because what you're really saying is what is our step one that's required here to get to step two? And let's focus on step one because if we go out of our way focusing on step 10 before we get to step one, then you know there's no point. Um, and so in an iterative context, MVP absolutely makes sense because you can basically throw everything else out and focus on that knowing that by getting your MVP, you get the resources and funding to do everything else. 
and that's the point. So then you iterate on it because MVPs don't sustain on their own. If you just have an MVP, put it live and then do nothing else, your company will die. And so, so I, I think the language of MVP is when taken out of an iterative context is, is can, can pose a slight risk, especially with non-technical stakeholders like the steering committee who kind of latch onto it and go, great, MVPs, are, we know an MVP is good, so let's try and find what that is. But taking it out of context of iter iteration means that there's almost this sense that from a technical perspective, if you get an MVP of something, that that will work. But actually that doesn't, you know, it doesn't exist, you know, it's a kind of a, it's a yeah, fictitious yeah. notion. So, um, so, so actually if we maybe move away from the frame of, of what is the MVP, and actually talk about what is open active, right? Because frankly, if it's not in, it's out. And if it's out, it's not open active. So it's, it's almost like frame. there are some libraries in there, which I think we can probably discard because no one's using them. And that's probably a good, you know, a good bit of exercise to go through. We don't need 300 repositories, a bunch of them are old and archived. And so being really clear about which are in scope and which are out of scope is definitely a worthwhile exercise. But for me, that's not a sense of Anything that's out is out, is done. We bin it, we delete it, we put it in the in the ice archive in the Arctic, you know, because it, it, it's dead at that point. You, you, you literally, it, it gets killed at the point it becomes it moved outside of the circle because because the volunteers are focusing on what's in the circle, right? And if yeah. the volunteers are focusing on what's in the circle and the open active is focusing on what's in the circle, then that's what that's what it is. Okay. Um, and and so I think I think that might be quite a um, a good thing to kind of separate. Really, is is now i think that's a really good point nick i mean mvp was me being clumsy with my language I, I agree entirely with you about what mvps are um but but, but yeah that 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 you're absolutely right what is that core that we're asking the volunteers and, and the maintainers to look after and defining that and being absolutely clear about that is really important and and i think the the, the one thing we don't have at the moment is clear roles and responsibilities around these roles and i think one of the things i want the steering committee to come away with thinking is actually we need to define some roles and we need to define some responsibilities and then we need to go through some sort of process to fill those roles uh so yeah I, um I, I, yeah that, that's all helpful you said you have more than one point i feel like we've had one and a half points i'm sorry yeah with some gusto <laughs> all just for the gusto um so uh i i, th I think so there's also something about i mean a group that has some kind of uh, I, I used to talk about accountability responsibility um I, I wonder if there's something like an operational responsibility and uh, uh, strategic responsibility or something to separate that idea I, it just is because if you have a group of people and you and you empower them you get the best out of them and if this volunteer group is just a bunch of like task monkeys that basically get given tasks by the masters in open active who are all getting paid and the, the peasants in the uh, you know, the volunteer group just have to take them on. That doesn't seem to me like a sustainable model that's going to bring people into the ecosystem. Um, it, whereas if we look at Chromium, it's very much the case that people uh, can make their ways into the maintainer of the maintainer hierarchy and get accountability at those levels. Now, in Chromium, there's an overall responsibility for the strategic direction in Chrome, which means that some ideas don't get past a certain criteria by, you know, they have to go to whatever committee it is that decides on if it's in or out. Um, but that's uh, um, a slightly different thing from kind of this this kind of separation of doers and thinkers or whatever it is, you know, that we, that we could end up with thinking responsibility accountability might mean um, versus a kind of more strategic notion of accountability. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. We need to be careful of that. And in my head, actually, the, the people making the decisions about what should happen to the infrastructure strategically are, are the maintainers you know that that's part of their role so actually the, the maintainers are there to make sure that this is heading in the right direction strategically the people who are accountable are there for making sure the thing still works and actually that that, that, that it, it continues to operate and it continues to meet the the needs of the wider community so i, I don't see maintainers as being um just purely a labor force they're there to provide some direction to to the maintenance of the infrastructure as part of that role and i think that's a really interesting thing to feed into roles and responsibilities Stephen, i think you've got your hand up yeah thanks andrew just a, an, another question occurred to me listening to nick chatting there about um which is all good discussion actually but um um how do we how would the committee kind of ensure there's a balance between 
data publishers and data providers on the um, maintenance group. And I'm, um, you know, it's and it's and it's it's clear from this this discussion today that, you know, apart from Andy at Gladstone, Andy's about the only one who's kind of uh, interested in this from the traditional um, data publishers. And I'm talking, you know, Gladstone XN, Legend Explore. Um, and then you've got the, all the data consumers who tend to be the ones who tend to be more engaged, more interested, uh, which is great. Uh, I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the way it is. Um, but that won't necessarily provide you with a balance in the maintainer group perhaps. So I just wanted to chuck that in there for as a discussion point. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point. And I don't know what the answer is. I would hope that if we could be clearer about what the roles and responsibilities are and what the benefits of participating in taking one of those roles is, we could attract a, a reasonably wide range of people to, to help support the infrastructure. A, a few, I've had conversations with a few people where they've said, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's open active, it's great, um, but actually making the business case to, be, to take part in it is really difficult because it, there isn't a clear ask. So actually, if we define mm. a clear ask, maybe that makes making the business case to take part easier. Um, and I hope that publishers and users could both see the benefit of being able to influence the, the, the core of this thing, actually. You know, if, 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 you, if you're a consumer or if you're a publisher, you know, being able to influence what the infrastructure is and how it works should deliver benefit to you. Um, and loads of people have got loads of views and opinions on why Open Active is or isn't right. But actually, let's have that debate. Let's have that debate about the infrastructure. Um, and I think it's a subtly different debate to the one we should be having in this group about specifications. Um, I think you, you, you need the governance of the specifications, the governance of the infrastructure, um, uh, uh, and I think they're, they're kind of separate and different. Um, and I know there have been different models over yeah. history of open access, but I do think they're, they are different conversations. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'd, I'd, yeah, I'd agree with that, and I'd, I'd, be different, but I, I'd also, just, to Stephen's point, I do wonder whether there's something about culture that we create in this group, um, if we're talking about this new group um, that's being created, and that, that's a culture of principles. And if we can put principles in place that represent balance, especially across the groups that Stephen's describing, such that we should have a, a situation where people are proud to represent the views that aren't in the room, to you know counter any proposals put forward and vice versa, so that we're not, you know, it's not, people aren't coming to represent their interests and lobbying for different things to move in different directions, but rather, trying to think what's best for open active and how do we put forward the, the right approach and and being uh, united around those principles that we can all agree on should help create better discussion, hopefully move us towards easier, you know, easier conversations. But I, I think that's the case in a lot of um, a, a lot of open source um, software has to balance interest. You know, in, in the Chromium example would be a key one between devs adding random features and keeping up with the W3C specs that are being built retro specs that they're trying to keep up with. Um, and, and balancing speed versus standards compliance is a, is, a key, is a key thing within that project, I'm sure. And so we're going to have some of the same issues here, um, I'm sure. And I, I noticed um, the add-on conversation we had in this group hasn't moved sufficiently fast that, that it, and so we've, we've ended up with some work happening in the infrastructure to get around that um, I noticed so and, and so there's, there's there's situations like that that are going to come um, come up a lot um, but if we've got a clear set of principles about what should be in repos and in branches and what we should be doing where and what and what balance we were striking between different interests at least as a as a, an idea you know like like for example a halfway between publisher and, and data consumers we spoke about in a previous call is a good place to try and aim for. Um, and, and both sides will obviously pull it in different directions. But, yeah. Cool. Helpful, oh, thank you. Uh, princi principles, a, a, a constitution, something like that. You know, I think we've already got one somewhere. Yeah, I'm sure we, we have, we have, I'm sure there are examples that we could reuse as well. Um, I think what one so I think one thing I'm kind of thinking based on the discussion that we've had is that we perhaps need us perhaps need to add something in here about perhaps a kind of really high level outline of what that maintainer group might do. Um, 
just to help the steering committee understand what that group might be and what that group could do. Um, so I'll have a think about a slide to that effect, but I don't want to build it up too much. Um, so, what, so, so I think that's been really useful. Um, what, what do we want from the steering committee as a kind of result of this conversation? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I'd be interested to, um, uh, sorry, Stephen was going to say something. Maybe, maybe not. No, all right, just look pensive. Um, uh, so um, uh, what I'd, I'd be interested in is, is, is the, the, that economics I mentioned, that chrome chromium problem, because I do feel like there's an ideal here and there's a bit of a gap. And that gap is in terms of who's going to actually, you know, who are the maintainers going to be? What's motivating them? Who's paying for that? Um, and I, I, I think what I'd be interested in actually, I, I'd be interested, but I'm not sure if you can get to this in the steering committee, but actually I think that there's quite a, quite a clear and present reality that we need to face here in, in the conversation. And that for me is, um, there is the possibility that we go the chrome chromium route here, right? Like given where we are, given the various issues we've got with with knowledge transfer and all the rest of it that's going on here, um, the Chrome route. If if there's Chrome Chromium, it could be that there's a there's a commercial version of Open Active that exists. And um, you know, not trying to blaspheme or anything, but I think that's the that's the reality, right? Because there needs to be, for me at least, there needs to be some people maintaining the stuff. And if we can't figure that out some other way, that has to be commercial, and therefore there needs to be a commercial thing to Open Active. And what that is or isn't is a good discussion to have. I mean, there is already commercial actors in the space. I'm in one of them. What does it look like to create the Chromium, um, the Chrome? Because remember, the reason that Google does what they do is not because they want to do good for the world, because they have a business model that revolves around Chrome. And that's very key. And that's how they put those resources in. So if we really want to recreate that set that setup here, then we need to practically think about what is the business model that's going to surround Open Active and how do we structure that? And I think that is actually, for me, where the meet, a meet of a conversation that's, that's, that's important to have here, because either it's grant funded, and therefore, for me, those volunteers need to be paid. There's not, there's not a business model around anyone doing anything in Open Active right now um, that's sufficient to cover the extent of the work that we're talking about. So um, those volunteers, for me, looking at the economics, won't magically start to do the work they're not already doing. And the ones that are already doing it are, are stressing constantly they, they can't do it within their current business model so there is a a real sense of unsustainability around just pushing it all on the volunteers and hoping that fixes it unless we solve the business model problem so for me there's there's two and it's quite binary but to make an illustration there's two routes here either the grant funding goes to the volunteers and we figure out a way of making that work such that it makes sense for their businesses to contribute and that's one way of making it sustainable or basically open active has a commercial version of I don't know what that looks like or how that works. And that is the thing that then helps drive the sustainability or the interests of those that are interested in sustaining. Very thorny conversation because we've spent a lot of time trying to defend Open Active from that. I get that. But I think, I think for me, if we really want to be, if, if this conversation goes really well, that's where we need to really look at. Like that, that I think is a successful, proper steering committee level conversation. It's like, are we really succeeding in our current model? Because it doesn't look like it, and we haven't really figured it out. So either we pull ourselves together and make grant funding flow to the volunteers and figure that out, or we go, we're not going to do that for all these reasons, and we're going to pick a commercial route. But what we can't do is continue in a kind of middle ground between the two where it's not really clear what's going on or who's benefiting, and we're expecting everyone to contribute for free, but no one's getting any benefit out of it because that doesn't, doesn't clearly work. So I think there's a real hard decision that needs to be made here, which is which route we're going to go down. And I think the steering committee, if briefed well, should be able to have a robust conversation about the pros and cons. But there's a there's quite a lot in that, and there's quite a few steps to get them to the thinking. But I think that's where the, the, I think we should be worrying about maintainer groups and who's in that or whatever. I think for me, it's much more fundamental. And when we, we figure out what model we're going for, 
then I think the maintainer groups and volunteers and all that stuff can, and principal, uh, you know, committees can come out in the wash. That's, you know, that's by the by, but that for me is not a steering group conversation. That's get the maintainers together and let them help, help them figure out principles and then take that back to the other groups to confirm that they haven't missed anything. You know, that, that can be done. But the, the, the steering level, the steering level conversation here is the commercial, non-commercial, I think. That's really helpful. Um... Uh, on top of that, you know, the, uh you know, less dramatic topic perhaps, but the idea of um, how we ensure we get that balance, like Stephen mentioned, you know, for, and that's something we've had on these calls since I started last what, August, July, August, uh, trying to get that balance of publishers and, and uh, consumers need those voices, you know, and, and, and new faces as well, new, new players in that, um, in in the community and unlocking that innovation, finding new ways to 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 promote and get value from the initiative. So ideas from the steering committee around that. I mean, it, it all falls from I think getting the model right, getting the direction right, um, and then a kind of sustained. Whether it's almost a, a relaunch or a, a re you know, um, but renewed effort to to get that community involvement progressing. No, that's great. I, all right, this is Andy. Sorry, I think just listening on this as well, I'm not saying it's high level or whatever, but as a software supplier in the market and that sort of thing with customers in the um, public sector, such as Greenwich Leisure or Everyone Active or whoever it will be. So I was leaving and we used to work with Greenwich Leisure. Maybe again one day, we'll wait and see. But um, for, for me, I think it's just really looking at the open active committee to provide maybe a reshape or a refocus of what the direction is of the roadmap in which they want to take it. Um, open data and open opportunity works well. I've seen many uh, um, a web page as such that consumes the data and displays it well uh, with the ability then to select a book and but it's knowing that wh where is it the community feels it needs to go from there. Do we need to, this might sound a bit tongue in cheek, but from the experiences, do do we need to make it more complicated than it is at this moment in time over and above open data opportunity? Is there is there options out there at the moment to be able to plug into existing integrations that will do the booking process without bringing in other third parties that could be perceived as overcomplicating the whole integration? Um, but I think really, you know, it's, it's really what is the roadmap where Open Active actually see this going over and above the open opportunity? Yeah, and that, that's the other discussion item at the steering committee, which is the next paper I have to write, um, the kind of strategic direction for Open Active. Um, uh, that's what I'm going to do after this call, I think. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point, Andy. Um, there's lots in there so that's really helpful thank you and I, i'm pretty sure that we won't get to the answer in the steering committee discussion next week but at least we'll have started and thinking about it um that's really helpful thank you everyone for the contributions so i'm just a little bit aware of time um just want to move on to aob um so i have one item of aob um i just wanted to give a quick update on the kind of thinking that we had behind having a roadmap and a work plan for this group. Um, it's a very short update. I haven't managed to do very much work on it yet because I keep getting pulled in other directions by, not least by the steering committee. Um, I, I think the steering committee and the discussions we've had at the A, uh, AEF and this group over the last few months have given me quite a lot of inputs. Um, I, I've started kind of trying to sort those into a bit of a roadmap for, for, for the group. Um, and I um, and I said this at the last meeting, but I will bring something to the next meeting for a discussion. Um, so that's where I've got to with that. Was there any other other business? I just thought I quickly mentioned just off of uh, Andy's point. This is a bit of an update for anyone that wasn't aware. Um, the LTA uh, Lawn Tennis Association have got a uh, activity finder on their website. Um, which they are integrating open data into and open booking into, which is very exciting. Um, and so we're going to have live integrations with um, 
initially Legend, Premier Tennis and Book Tech through open booking through the LPA. So there'll be a, a real thing we can point at and go, there's booking working to Andy's point in case, uh, you know, just in case we were lacking uh, that as a, as a thing, because I know it's been some time since a lot of those integrations started. And so actually having them finished and somewhere, because the MCR project hasn't delivered that vision, um, but, but the LTA will, which is great. And so um, hopefully we can, um, we can see the, uh, the good fruits from that, and then that can help incentivize others to, to join in. That's great. Um, Nick, is that sorry? Nick, sorry, Andrew. Nick, is that with Club Spark or is that with, through you guys? Uh, is that through? Sorry, which is through Club Spark? You said the LTA. So, because um, their website, they use a, a tool called Club Spark, don't they? If I remember rightly. Uh, so, Club Spark is their booking system. That booking yeah. system is open booking and open data um, compliant to an extent. They're doing some work to fix it properly now. Um, and the front end is Deloitte that's built that. So their, their activity finder is Deloitte. Okay. Good. Quite interesting. Yeah. Powered. Yeah. But obviously, I'm in, I'm in um, powering that experience. So that we're in Deloitte as well, of course. Otherwise, I wouldn't be, you know, shouting about it quite in the same way. Maybe, maybe I would be because I love Open Active, but who knows? Yeah, I wasn't sure. Yeah, that's why I wanted to double check. Okay. And is that build just for? courts or courses as well as courts it's both okay thanks it's really interesting and i think the other thing i'd like is we're having we're in quite early discussions now with the fa who are really all of a sudden interested in open active um they built uh, a, a website called find football and they've put quite a lot of effort into building that. And what they want to do now is build some open access teams coming out of flying football. Um, so we've got a, a kickoff meeting with them. I think it's next week um, in, in London. Um, but I, I think they'll be able to move really rapidly um, once they know what they've got to do. I think it's good news as well. And there are several companies in the ecosystem who are working with the FA on various football projects at the moment. So football will hopefully be a growth area for us. And we've already got play football as an open booking and open data compliant uh, system, so we can give them play football straight away, which would be great. This is really good. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Um, right. Uh, we're nearly at the end of the meeting there. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone on this call is already a member of W3C community, but if ever, anyone watching afterwards has got this far and uh, would like to join, please do. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's a link to the worth joining the slides which I'll, I'll share with the presentation uh, and, and the video so thank you everyone and I'll see you all soon.